Allison, you go first. Hi, I'm Allison Smith. I'm with UVM Extension 4-H also, and uh, I'm calling in from Bolton, and I will let Debbie introduce herself. Hi, I'm Debbie Gillen, and I am the a 4-H program assistant, um, and I'm going to talk to you about birding today. It, it was something that I really loved in college uh, when I went to UVM, and it's something that I've carried with me since then. So I'm going to want to share some of that with you today. Okay. Um, so whoever just annot did the annotate, you need to not do that. Um, Debbie, I'm going to have to have you unshare for a moment. Okay. I don't know how to give you directions. Okay. So you guys, we are not going to be using the any of the annotation tools. So I think somebody and whoever's sharing their screen, uh, if you want to go to the PowerPoint, we're that's me inbox right now. Yeah. So I can while you guys set up with that, that was I can, a mistake. I can talk right, a little Deb, bit. Go ahead. Okay. About the uh, social code while while Debbie puts up our PowerPoint. But uh, yeah, so just a reminder that um, we're asking you all to be present and stick with us here. Um, and also, so our first, the first thing I would like to mention is if we could all, um, this is a social, right? So we're- Deb, can you advance one slide, please? Yep. yep. There you uh, go. Thank you. We're trying to have some fun here, build some connection with youth. We have folks from all across Vermont and beyond, Massachusetts, Portugal, so cool. So with that, I ask that we all be kind and respectful for one another. So some of the functions that we talked about as you were coming in, if, if you uh, move your cursor towards the bottom of your screen, you'll see that participant list. You click on that, that'll give you a list of names. And as Laura mentioned, there's a, near your name, you can actually click to raise your hand if you have a question. Later on in the PowerPoint, Debbie might have some questions that she poses to the group. And if you want to chime in or share, you can click that button. Um, and there's also the chat box. And just to reinforce what Lauren said, pretty much for, for this presentation, those are the main functions. And there's probably going to be some polls too. Um, but otherwise, that's all you really need to participate. Um, so be courteous, be respectful. This is a social. Um, also, if you can just try to limit any distractions. So you know, no making silly faces, or if you have a really like crazy stuff is going on in the background, um, you can, you know, turn your camera off or find a quiet place. And also, if you're calling in with a tablet or a phone, it's really helpful if you can set that down. Um, that way we don't all go on a roller coaster ride with you. So I think with, uh, without further ado, it's pretty straightforward and simple. I'm excited to talk about birding. So I'll pass it off to you, Debbie. Okay. So we're going to start with um, having you go to the chat box and write down what your favorite bird is and if you know what the Vermont state bird is. But don't look it up. Just if you happen to know or have a guess. Ooh, I see one, one person has written Golden Eagle. Ooh. These are some favorite birds coming through. See Raven, Peacock, Osprey. We have some guesses for the state bird. Okay. So, Chickadee, Blue Jay, Owls, Cardinal, Debbie, do you want me to read off what people have said for the state bird? Or, sure. Or wait. Okay. <laughs> so I'm seeing uh, a few people are saying hermit thrush or thrush. Mm -hmm. And I think that those were the main guesses so far. Okay. So the winner is hermit thrush. <laughs> nice job. And, um, yes, for whoever knew what that, it was the hermit thrush. And on the screen here, this is a hermit thrush. And you might say, wow. That's not really a bird that stands out to me. Um, maybe I've never seen it. Um, 
It's not a particularly showy bird. Um, and it really, a lot of people probably haven't seen it because it lives in the woods and um, it really is one of those birds that's identified often by how it sounds. Um, so you, so you might say, well, why did this bird become our state bird? And that is because it occurs, it lives in every single county in Vermont. So that was the main reason that it was chosen, that everyone could see it or hear it. Um, also, it has a really pretty song. Um, and I'm going to play that for you. It's very flute-like. Um, see if you can hear that. Okay, so that's the hermit thrush. Now, if you were not able to hear that, you might need to turn up your volume on your computer um, because we're gonna be listening to some more bird songs in a little while. Um, okay, so before we get really started, I have an announcement. And that is to take down your bird feeders if you have them up. Um, because as, as awesome as it might be to see a scene like this in your backyard, it's really not awesome at all. Um, because not only that your bird feeders are probably gonna get destroyed and they're expensive, uh, but more importantly, um, when we encourage bird uh, bears to come in and um, come close to our homes, that becomes a problem and can be very bad for bears. Um, sometimes they have to be relocated. Sometimes they're put down because they don't know. They get attracted and um, now it's a problem. So the state of Vermont, Fish and Wildlife, they suggest that you only have your bird feeders up from the beginning of December to the end of March. Um, if spring comes early, then you might wanna take them down early. Um, this actually was um, an article referring to something that happened back in 2012 with our then governor um, at the time. This was in his backyard. He had four bears and he, it was the middle of April and he did not take the advice of the Vermont Department of Wildlife and he got stuck with bears in his backyard. And so there was a big article on it um about governor shumlin so kind of interesting um but we don't want to see that happen in anybody's backyard okay so moving on to what birds live in vermont so or that we see in vermont not all of them live here so we have birds that are here all year long and they're year-round residents they're here through thick and thin the summer, the winter, um, and then we have just the birds that come in in the summer, and those birds are starting to arrive. Um, some of them have, there's still a lot to come. Um, we have birds that are here only in the winter, and that's kind of hard to believe when we think of, wow, there's birds that actually come here in the winter because they like it here. <laughs> Um, and yes, uh, some come from more in the northern um, Canada, Canadian area, they'll come down to Vermont because it's a little bit less wintry down here than it is up there. Um, and then we have a whole group that really just pass through here on their way more north. Um, so this is just a place to stop and rest and eat before they carry on north to where they're headed. And then again, um, when they come back through in the fall to go um, to their winter resident areas. So right now, the birds that are coming, they're migrating in. Some are coming from a really long distance, like South America. And then some are coming from not too far, like maybe just Massachusetts or Virginia. Um, things like robins, they don't migrate very far. 
Um, and they're some of the earlier ones that get here because they don't have very far to go, or red-winged blackbirds. Um, so here, just on my screen, um, here's a scarlet tanager. That is a bird that migrates here. Um, over here, um, and I'm all covered up. Sorry, let me just move. Um, here's a goldfinch, uh, another bird that migrates. Um, this is a peregrine falcon over on the top right. Um, a year-round resident, the black-capped chickadee. This here in the center is a barred owl. And then this beautiful bird down here is one of those winter residents that sometimes comes, which is a snowy owl. Um, I have a question. Uh, what, and I think there may be some other questions coming in and we can address those in just a second. Um, so what do you think is the main reason why birds either come here, say in the winter, or um, they have to leave um, because they don't have it? What might be that main reason why birds can either stay here or they can't? And you could put that in the chat box if you have some guesses. I did see one hand go, uh, come up over the, um, the raise hand function from mm -hmm. Katie. I think that not her name, but I can, do you mind if I unmute? Sure. All right. Military. Um, Major, yes. whatever her name is. <laughs> do you have an answer for the question? I, I didn't hear the question. Sorry, say that again. Who's talking to you? And so hey. my name is Katie, but I think, I think that's not your name if I remember from this morning. Is it? So, Olivia. Or Olivia, sorry. Okay. What was your question? Um, I know the answer to the question. Okay, what is it? Um, some birds, it's either too cold for them to stay, or the ones that like to stay like year round, it's just like a good temperature, and the ones that stay in winter, they like the snow or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that they definitely have to be able to handle the cold weather, but it's actually something else that really makes the big difference of whether they can stay or not. Does anybody else have guesses? I'm also seeing in the chat box, so some other people are guessing, um, maybe it's predators or for food, the snow food source, or birds migrate to move to warmer places or places yep. with more food. Yeah, um, so food is the big factor, the biggest one. And I bet there are birds that just say, I don't wanna brave this cold. You know, my body's not, can't handle this, so I'm gonna head south. But um, food is the biggest factor. So like this snowy owl, every few years, they tend to come down because their food source, which is lemmings, I believe, little rodents, um, they, they have a cycle that ebbs and flows. And so when they don't have enough food up north, they come down here for a while. Um, some of the birds, like say this goldfinch over here, it eats a lot of its diet is thistle. And there's none of that in the winter that it can sustain itself. A lot of birds are, eat flying insects and there aren't those here in the winter. So they have to go somewhere else to get the diet that they need. So the ones that stay here, they have a way to um, make it through and they have their food source secure. Um, so let's see, I think we're gonna take a little break for a poll for all of you. Okay, our first poll is, here's the question. If you don't see the poll coming up, you can answer in the chat box, but um, the question is how many species of birds live in Vermont at least part of the year? So these are really the ones that are breeding here, not the ones that just kind of stop in, um, kind of like our main base of birds. Um, so how many do you think? live in Vermont? Is it 80, 145, 
260 or 590. You all should see the poll now. I see people are answering. If for some reason you don't see the poll, just write in the chat box. While you're taking the poll, I need to ask, someone has the name Ophart, Opart family, O-P-H-A-R-D-T. Can you type in the chat box and let me know who you are? I'm trying to take attendance and that's just not matching anything I have. So thank you. Okay. I think we probably got most of the, well, we've got a few more coming in. Okay, well, the correct answer is 260. So 47% of you got that. Um, so that's really a pretty good diversity of birds in Vermont. And I bet if any of us tried to make a list of all the birds that we know, we wouldn't even come anywhere near close to that. Um, so it's a lot. And worldwide, there are 10,000 about species of birds. So there's a lot of birds in the world. Um, okay, so we are now gonna talk about what are birds doing right now? So we kind of talked about that already a little bit, that some of them are starting to come back here, um, migrating, some of them are already here. A lot of them um, that are migrating, if they've gotten here, they're just eating a lot and trying to regain their energy from migrating. Um, let's see, some are already starting to make nests. And this picture up here is a bird that's actually collecting fur from a live possum to use in its nest. Um, my daughter says, oh, they do that with horses too. Um, they'll just gather it up because it's great nesting material. Um, there's a lot of birds that are, are trying to find where they're gonna live. So they're setting their territory. And um, this little bird down here, who's got its wings up in the air. Um, birds are not real big for you know, animals usually. Um, but when they are trying to defend their territory or set it, they try to make themselves look as big as they can. So they'll do things like stretch their wings out or fan their tail feathers or puff up spots on their, um, their, of their feathers that are like brightly colored to make them look bigger. To say, I'm strong, this is my place, stay away. And you know, they don't want conflict, but this is the way that they just let each other know that this is my home. Um, they also sing a lot. That's another way of setting their territory. Um, so soon, I mean, there are probably some birds that are already starting to build nests, um, but soon they'll be laying eggs and then rearing their young. Um, so there's a lot of activity that's about to start happening um, out there. Um, Okay, we can, I was gonna have you give me some thoughts on if you were gonna identify birds, what are the things that you're looking for? And you can, we can either do this in the chat box or you can raise your hand and um, tell me your thoughts out over how, what are things that you would look for or think about when identifying birds? Looks like Heidi's hand has gone up. Okay. Heidi? All right, Heidi. Um, I think it would be like looking for just them flying across the sky or maybe them calling to each other, like their sounds, like their songs. Their sounds or songs, yeah. Excellent. Kylie has already uh, has raised her hand as well. I'll unmute. Um, so me and my dad went bird watching before, and he says what to look for a lot is the color eye um, and what color its wings are. Mm -hmm. um, maybe the way it sounds and stuff like that. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Anybody else have some ideas? 
Okay, lots in the chat box as well. Iola says color, size, song, and shape. Yeah. Um, Larry said their colors. Jules mentioned colors and size. Sylvia says body proportions, which I thought was a really interesting oh. um, and a good one. And Rowan says color and shape. Yep. Uh, Ellen mentions, mentions behavior. Aha. Uh -huh. Yep. Great. Okay, we're going to take a look at that. <clears throat> okay, so a lot of you mentioned what do they what do they look like kind of in that category so size color um, markings literally some species are to are told apart by that eye color or an eye ring or um, it might have a color on their tail versus on their back. I mean, they're, when you start looking into identifying birds, it can be very fine details. Um, you can also tell a lot about um, a bird by its beak or by what its feet look like. Um, also, how do they fly? There are certain birds that you know what they are just by seeing them fly. You don't even, you don't have to see their color or anything like that. Um, you can also tell a lot about narrowing down birds by where you're seeing them. So what you're seeing at the top of the mountain is probably gonna be different than what you're seeing in your pond or on, you know, next to a lake or a river or out in the middle of a grassy field versus in the deep forest or on the edge. So knowing where you're seeing them is a really, really key piece of information. Um, and then a number of you also mentioned songs and calls. So those are um, really when you get into birding, that's the key. Because if you're anything like me, um, one, I don't see very well. Two, I don't carry my binoculars everywhere. Um, three, I just, I kind of think of myself as a lazy birder, but when I was researching this, I found a comment that said 90% of birding is hearing the birds. And then I said, oh, that makes me feel better. I'm not really lazy. It's just that once, it's really hard to see birds. Once the leaves come on the trees, and you know they're small if you don't have your binoculars it's really hard to actually see them well so if you can learn their songs and calls you can know who's out there without having to struggle to find them although it is awesome when you get to really observe a bird and i it's well worth that time to do that um so we're going to talk more about bird songs um, but before we do that, um, I mentioned here, so things to help you in identifying birds um, are a good pair of binoculars. I have a pair, this is my standard eight by 42 pair of binoculars. And then bird books. There are so many types of bird books out there. Mine looks like this. It has no cover front or back anymore. Um, it's been used a lot. I have it all marked up. Um, I circle things in it. Um, so there's some resources for looking um, later at field guides, but you can also do a lot on your phone. There's lots of apps that um, if you have a phone, you can bring out there as well and help you. You can look it up on the spot um, using that if you don't have a bird book or if you prefer that way. So let's talk a little bit about bird songs. Are there any questions before I go on to bird songs? Looks like Anthony has a question. Anthony, okay. I am unmuting you. I just wanted to say I've heard of a really cool app that I use a lot. Oh, cool. well, it doesn't only do birds, but it does any like living thing. Yeah. A naturalist. You should probably want to check it out. iNaturalist? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yes. Um, that is on my resource list at the very end of this presentation. Um, so great. Thank you for 
mentioning that. Okay, so here are some common birds, most of which are here right now. So if you um, aren't familiar with these birds, these are a good one to take a look at because you might be able to go outside right after this and actually hear or see them. Um, so this first one, this is called a song sparrow. And they're out like more in the open, maybe on the edge of a field. Um, they're very vocal right now, probably where I'm at. They are what I hear the most every day. Um, and in birding, we have a way to describe songs. Um, and that has a big name called mnemonics. And basically, it's putting words to a song so that it helps us remember that song. Because they're, we're talking, okay, we're not gonna probably see 260 species, but even if we're trying to learn 50, that's a lot of bird songs to try to remember what they are. So the song sparrow, it has three to four introductory notes and then a series of notes and usually a trill. So to that song, one way to think about it is, um, Maids, 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 put on the kettle a little. So see if that sounds remotely like what I'm talking about. I think the first, um, the, the second time this bird sings in the recording sounds a little bit more like that. So here we go. Okay, so that is a song sparrow. It's very loud. Um, it's a brown bird. Look for this dark spot right on its chest. And that's a great way to tell that's the song sparrow. And then you hear the song. If you can see the bird and hear the song, then that helps you to remember um, the song. So another one, so everybody's probably seen robins. They are a thrush, just like the hermit thrush that's our state bird. It's the same family. So they have that flute light song. The robin says, cheery up, cheerly, cheery up, cheerly. Okay, so one thing to add about bird songs and calls. Just like we're all talking English or speaking a language, but we all sound different. We have different intonations in our voice. We have different um, uh, volumes. We say things differently. So, so in the song sparrow, you heard that same bird making the song sound three different ways. So these are just very basic guidelines um, but they're going to sound different. They're, they're not going to conform always to the way we think they are. Sometimes that song sparrow, it just, it'll say those three or four first introductory notes and that's it. It doesn't even finish it, but you just get used to hearing that. And then, you know, oh, that one just, for some reason, decided to stop. Um, okay. Another one, red, red wing blackbird. So you would see a, whoops. A red winged blackbird really out in a marshy area or along a field where there's ditches, um, where there's cattails. A lot of times you see them on, on those. And the classic song for them, it's, it says what sounds like conclary. And Again, they're really loud birds, um, very visible with their red patches. Um, oh my goodness, let's see. Um, another one over here, it keeps going forward on me. Um, this is um, the Eastern Wood Peewee, 
and it's um, in the family of flycatchers. And this is an excellent example of why you want to know their songs because every one of the flycatchers looks pretty much like that. So unless you <laughs> are an amazing birder, it's going to be really hard to tell who that is. But they have such different songs and calls and that immediately you know that's a peewee. So the peewee says its name. Peewee, Pia, and its cousin, um, the Phoebe, you might all also know, um, says its name. It says Phoebe, Phoebix, Phoebe, Phoebix. So those two would um, flycatchers being really um, in the same area, possibly you can no problem you know who they are okay last one up here is called the oven bird this is another great example of one that you probably never ever ever are going to actually see because it's on the forest floor and it's very secretive but it has the loudest song i think you hear in the woods in the summertime um, and it says something that sounds like teacher 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 I think that's it. Okay. Um, do we have any questions before we move on about mnemonics, bird songs? I know that there was a question just a little while ago if asking if we knew how many birds there are in the world. Um, I think as far as species, 10,000, but individuals, no idea. Wow. Thank you. No idea. A lot. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Are we okay to go on? So if you're interested in mnemonics, on the resources page at the end, they have a whole list of um, those kinds of little phrases that might help you remember um, bird songs. Okay, we have another poll coming up that you caught a glimpse of, because I kept forwarding. So if, again, if you're not seeing the poll, you can um, put it in the chat box. Um, here's the question. What is the most common species of bird in the world? Is it pigeon, starling, chicken, or goose? And Debbie, after we do the poll, I didn't realize but Heidi's hand was raised. Okay. Question. Yeah, we can go, go back. Thanks. Oh, it keeps going back and forth. Yeah. Okay, we'll wait just another couple seconds. I think pigeon is winning out on the poll, um, but that's not the right answer. So chickens are the most common, uh, the most abundant bird in the world. And when you think about that, um, chickens are something that we eat, we raise to eat, we raise to have eggs. They're everywhere on every continent every city town i mean even cities even um you know they're everywhere in the world um so chickens are the most common bird species um this photo is a flock of starlings just to let you know so it was a little bit of a trick like maybe maybe think having you think it's starlings um but birds can um um, flock together in huge amounts, um, especially when they're migrating. 
Okay, we're gonna go on to a little bit about bird nests. And uh, do you mind if I oh, um, Heidi yes. her question? Yes, thank you for reminding me. No worries. All right, Heidi, you are unmuted. Um, oven bird. Why is it named the oven bird? Oh, that's a great question. I heard the first question of why is it called the oven bird, but I didn't hear the rest. Is it like, is it because they need really hot temperatures? Oh, no. So oven birds are called oven birds because, and I was going to mention this, you, you're preempting my next slide, is that they actually make a nest that looks like a little oven. Hmm. So you know, like um, pizza ovens, how they're like round on the top. And then they just have a little hole to go in where you put the, the pizza in. Wow. So the oven birds make a little nest at, pretty much just out of leaves that looks like a little oven. And you would never probably ever find one in your life, even if you were out there hunting, because they are so camouflaged. Um, they're amazing, but that's how they get their name. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit more about about nests. So when we think of nests, I think we think of what these look like up in a tree made of sticks. Um, but nests can be as simple as, as out of leaves or a depression in the dirt. Um, they can be cavities like this over here that the nuthatch or chickadees or woodpeckers, um, owls might use. Um, or wood ducks. So, but we're going to talk more about kind of our, the traditional type of nest um, and just how specific they are to species. Um, like even a bird that is raised in captivity and goes out and builds its own nest, it builds it consistent with the rest of its species. It's going to look just like everybody else's that's say a scarlet tanager. And that amazes me to think that that is just inherent for that bird, that they know somehow that they're supposed to make their nest completely out of twigs like this. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, this nest over here, many of you I'm sure have seen a robin's nest, maybe <clears throat> not so commonly in a tree, but underneath a roof or in your garage, um, in your entryway, <laughs> a place maybe you don't want robins making a nest. Um, but they so commonly, they have this mud cap on the top um, and then it's lined with like fine grass. Um, and then in contrast down here, this is a red-eyed vireo, which is a bird that lives um, in the woods and it always makes its nest in a nice little V like that. And it's neat and tidy. It's um, made of birch bark and I think they said wasps, uh, wasp nest material. Um, so different birds are, use specific materials and make specific looking nests. Um, let's see. Um, one thing just to note, <clears throat> even though birds make a nest, almost all of them only make a nest once a year, like they don't, they don't come back to that same nest. There are, except for things like eagles, they reuse nests. I'm sure there are some others, but most don't. But you're still not supposed to take them and have them. Like you're not supposed to bring them in your house or um, collect them. And I'm not sure why that is, especially since they're not coming back to use them again, but um, just a note to throw out there. Um, so we talked a little bit about some materials here. I'm wondering if you can either raise your hand or you can put in the chat box, um, what other, what nesting materials come to mind that you think birds use? Or what do you think might be good materials to use? 
on another. In animal fur. Mm -hmm. uh, says twigs and mud. Paola says hair for sure. Sometimes trash. She says badly. Yep. Sticks, twigs, mud. <clears throat> yep. Okay. So we're going to look at. Okay. We're going to talk about what are more commonly um, in nests. So you've got most of them, twigs, grass, straw, mud, um, soft materials like fur, cattail fluff or milkweed fluff, um, leaves, pine needles, moss. Any of those are materials that are um, natural and that birds are gonna use. Um, one of your potential activities that you can do at, to come back on Thursday is to collect some of these good materials for the birds because it actually takes quite a bit of um, effort for the birds to go and get all of that material to make their nests. So if we compile some of those things for them and they just have to come get them, um, we're making it easier for them and it's gonna be cool to watch them come and take a little bit of this and that out of it as well. So we talked about what the good choices are. Um, some of the bad um, are, like someone said, trash. There, um, there was actually a story I read that every year, since we talked about eagles building on their nest and they're big birds, so they bring in all kinds of trash and put it in their nest. So there are actually people that will go up into the nest and remove bags and Somebody said there was a plastic shovel and you know all kinds of just trash up in their nest that they will remove um, so that it's not a danger to the birds. So some things that you should not put out if you're going to do this is anything that's long and strong. So human hair is not good, um, yarn or ribbon and online, I saw so many places where they suggested putting yarn out for birds. So don't believe that that's what you're, you should do because anything that's long and strong, it can get wrapped around like their foot or something like that. And it can um, get their foot caught up and then they can't move, they can't fledge um, and they can't break it because it's so strong. Um, I would think, when I saw dryer lint, I thought, oh, that might be nice and soft. But when it gets wet, it mats down and it's really not that insulative and it can stay wet. Um, and then, of course, anything that might have chemicals sprayed on it would not be a good choice to put out there. So someone, this is a suet feeder. So since you're not feeding your birds anymore because you took them down, as of the end of March, right? Um, you could refill some of those feeders with maybe some good choices. Um, and then over here, I loved this. It's not only functional, but beautiful. Um, this is just some chicken wire that was made in, just folded over into like a cone shaped. And then they took one piece of wire to hang it and put a couple dowels in and then layered it up with all these beautiful materials that you could put out. Um, so that's something if you are interested, um, this could be something that you could do this week. Um, but we have about three other potential projects you could do. Um, are there any questions right now before I go on? I see Heidi's hand is up um, and I think she might have a question. Okay. And I'm going to make a request again. Please do not annotate or write on the slides. Okay. We, we specifically said that was not allowed. So, um, and then Kylie also has her hand up as well. Oh, I didn't hear that. Um, I just forgot to lower my hand. So I go. Oh, okay. Awesome. Sorry about that, Heidi. Let's go to Kylie. Kylie, I'm unmuting you now. I know. 
this is a kind of weird question, but do you know if there's more boy birds or girl birds? Hmm. I don't know if there are, but I can tell you that um, the male birds are usually the ones that you hear singing more than, you know, sometimes the females will sing, but it's mainly the males mm. in bird species. Yeah. So, okay. We're going to go on to your other potential things you could do this week. So if you do the material stash, take a picture for us so we can see what you put together. Um, you could simply go out and observe some birds. Sit quietly for 10 minutes somewhere, see what you hear or notice any behavior. Um, if you see some birds, you don't have to be able to identify them, that's okay. Um, if you wanna do that, you can switch to a different habitat maybe and see if you're seeing something different um, than in the first place that you sat quietly. Um, you can share what you observed with us on Thursday, either um, just telling us about it or you could write it down if you want. Um, you could tell a personal bird story. Um, these two pictures are of my daughter um, and these are a couple of our bird stories which maybe I'll share um, when we come back on Thursday. So again you could write that down or you could just tell us about it. Um, and then lastly, if you were really interested in the bird songs, you could learn one and you could either tell us about it or hopefully demonstrate it because that would be cool. Um, so again, that mnemonics list is on the next page uh, or a couple pages down. Um, and I'm going to show you quickly how to look up a bird on a site. But I wanted to show you something really cool, um, which is somebody that's really good at making bird calls. I'm gonna see if this, oops. I'm just gonna play just a couple seconds of this, but this link is also on the page, so you can watch the whole thing. This guy is amazing um, at what he can do with his voice. Um, all right, here we are at the our resources page, um, and there's a lot of great um, organizations here, Audubon, iNaturalist, which was mentioned, uh, Cornell um, Lab of Ornithology, Vermont eBird was something that I um, found recently. Um, all of these sites have ways for you to be citizen scientists, um, to track and give information to ornithologists who are the, the scientists that study birds, to help them um, track birds and other animals uh, so that they can use that in their research. So it's one of the ways that we just as normal people can help out and you can learn more about those um, by visiting those sites. I don't know what we're having doing for time here. Um, Debbie, uh, we are at 3.51, so we're at a perfect spot to wrap up. Um, okay. Wanted to mention a few things. So um, Debbie had put a bunch of the activities um, on the previous slide. And for those of you who can come back and join us Thursday at 3, after today's session, Lauren will send an email out with a link and a reminder. And we also put the PowerPoint in a Google folder. So that way, um, whether for this week or in the future, you wanna come back and look at this slide with all the resources, that's there for you. Also, we know that this week we have um, some youth from MKVT here. So um, as part of April camp for military youth, and you have some other programming on Thursday. So if you can't make it back, if you want to take out um, a pen and paper, I'll write it in the chat box, but you can always take pictures of your, of any of the activities that you did with birding and you can post it to Facebook at MKVT or use a hashtag purpleupbt2020. Again, I'll write that in the, um, the chat box, but we're happy that you're all here. 
And so uh, for those of you who can come back on Thursday, we do hope you come back and, and we'll just share out our projects and talk about birds. And even if you don't get a chance to do any of these things, please come back because it's so awesome just to hear and learn from what other people are doing. So, um, you know, don't feel that you can't come back if you don't have something to share. Do, are there any questions or comments? There is one other thing that if anybody wants to stay one more minute um, that I can do and show you a, a site where you can look up birds. Did you have something, Allison? It does look like Anthony has had his hand raised and okay. that's been for a little while. So I'm going to unmute him. Anthony, did you still want to ask a question or chime in? Hey, there's a whole list of resources, but is there a way to see this online or something? Um, you should be able to, you should be able to click those links when that PowerPoint is sent to you oh. um, to be able to look at them. And I specifically wanted to look at, um, yeah. Oh, did you keep going? So is the PowerPoint going to get sent to us? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, to clarify, I'm going to send everyone an email probably tomorrow morning that will have a link to a Google folder. And in that Google folder will be the PowerPoint. So you can click through it and click on the links that you are interested in. Okay. Yep. And if for some reason the links didn't bring you, um, to where it's supposed to, you can always copy those links and paste them in your browser. Um, so anybody that has another minute is welcome to stay. I was going to show you how to search a bird on Vermont eBird. I'm going to stop sharing the slideshow right now. Um, and this is, can you see this now? No. You sure can't. you hit share. It is, hold on. I've got to go back. Sorry. Looks Here like lots of people love birds I'm seeing from the comments. <laughs> yeah. They seem inspired and energized. And we yeah. can see it now, Deb. Okay, so here, this is eBird, and that's one of the links on your resource page. Um, can somebody just uh, write in the chat box a bird they want me to look up? First one in was Osprey. Osprey. Okay, so we put in Osprey. It's the only one that comes up. So you click on that. It's going to show you. Um, pictures of the adults, the juveniles. Um, here you can listen, which we'll do that in a second. There's a world range map. You can put in where you live down here, choose a region. I was going to try to do that, but it's not happening. Oh, there it is up here. So I'll put in Vermont, and then that'll narrow it down. Osprey is a good one to choose. Sometimes when you do this, and it's a really, really common bird, um, well, it's showing it all over. So it's showing Osprey can be just about anywhere. Um, down here, this green chart shows you what months of the year you can find it here and in what abundance. So the, this probably is based on how many, um, how often it's seen. Then they have videos and they have, um, this is what is really cool, I think. So we talked about the mnemonics, like having the words to go with your um, songs. Well, this is something different. And I, it's called, this is to actually visualize the calls and the songs. And it's called a spectrogram. So let's see if this is a good one. So it's showing little markings. That's not the greatest. 
Let's see if this one's any better. So it's not a very complicated song, but I think you maybe get the idea that it's showing you what is being, what the song or call is. And when you get into more complex songs, it, it's, it could be a really good way for some people to, to remember them. Okay, so then uh, there's also other information, um, but every time I go back, it X's out of that. So just a good resource if anybody wants to check that out on their own. And that's all I have, unless anybody has any other comments or questions. Thank you so much for coming and listening about birds. Um, and I'm really looking forward to what you um, come back with on Thursday. Yes, please come back. I'm dying to learn from all of you. This would be so much fun. Somebody find a really cool bird song and teach it to all of us. Uh, Kylie raised her hand. Um, all right, Kylie, you are unmuted. Thank you. So um, I'm sorry if you guys already said this, but um, I couldn't hear because my, um, my, my computer is glitching a little bit. Um, but on Thursday, is it going to be another Birding 101? No, it's just going to be you all sharing. Okay. But, and, and asking questions. Like if you during the week are like, I want to ask about whatever, um, you can bring those questions to the table and we'll just see what we can answer. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Oh, I think we've got another hand raised. Looks I like see Jules. Jules. All right. Um, is it the same meaning password? No, I will. For the I'll meeting send, on Thursday. Nope, I'll send an email to everybody, which will have a new Zoom link with a new password. So you'll have to get that from me, and that will come out Thursday morning. Anything else? That was a lot of information. You really held it together. There's so much to learn about birds. It's incredible. And it's really hard to put it into a little time span. Yeah, some great questions and really fun seeing those poll answers come in. So great job yeah. being engaged. And uh, we hope to hear from you again on Thursday. So. Was there one more hand? Oh yeah, raised. Um, it looks like Ellen, but I know that's not not your name. <laughs> it's Elsa. Elsa. Yeah. So, um, can we like uh, take pictures of birds and like show them mm -hmm. to each other? Yeah. Yeah. If you can, it's hard to do, but if you can get some pictures, that's awesome. Yeah, I took a few pictures a oh. while ago. Great. Yeah, we'd love it. Anything, anything about birds that you want to share, really, um, you know, would be great. We just gave you some ideas of some things you could do. But if you can come up with a creative thought, please bring it. Okay, well. well Thank you all for coming today. Let's thank Debbie for really opening our eyes and ears to the world of birding. We look forward to seeing you all again on Thursday, see what you all have learned, and we'll all be teaching each other on Thursday. Mm -hmm.